first of all, thank you for coming on here, Swami. My pleasure, Gary. So, getting right into this, how would you describe what exactly it is that you do over at the ashram? Well, um, the essential thing is meditation um, and discovering the inner world. And also, do, we do a lot of chanting here, and we also do uh, a form of self-inquiry called Shiva Process, in which uh, questions are asked inwardly in order to discover the self and unblock uh, things that block knowledge of the self. And basically, I'm here because my guru, Swami Muktananda, many years ago, initiated me and told me to go and teach meditation and also to awaken people through the process of Shaktipat, awaken Kundalini energy. Uh, and he wanted me to start an ashram. First ashram I ran was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then during his lifetime, he sent me to several others. And finally, I ended up in uh, Australia. So it's I always I feel that what we do here is a continuation of the work that he gave me. Mm. Would you want to get into your journey a little bit of how you came to meet Muktananda? Sure. That's uh, well. It goes back to my days in New York. I'm from New York, and um, I was in uh, uh, graduate school. Uh, in English literature, and um, I had a, an event that happened to me, a very New York event, where I was living on the uh, Lower East Side, and uh, I was with some friends in an apartment, and there was a knock at the door, and I was closest to the door, so I opened it, and a gun was thrust in my face, and he said that he was looking for a certain fellow named Dave Sinclair, who had burned him in a drug deal, he said. And he made us all lie down, show us our IDs. And when he, we saw, he saw that none of us were Dave Sinclair, he said, I've got to apologize to you guys. And he left. <laughs> it says very New York experience. But it had a big impact on me because when he put the gun in my face, I thought, the, my first thought was, oh, my God, it's over. And what a waste of all that education. <laughs> so, yeah. and, uh, and afterwards, I started thinking, if life can be snuffed out so quickly, what are we doing this for? I started having deeper thoughts about the meaning of life and things like that. So it was the start of an awakening. Mm -hmm. And from that, I got interested in uh, uh, reading Gurdjieff. Somehow I got involved in reading Gurdjieff and studying his teachings. And then uh, later, uh, always, you know, I didn't have any interest in Indian, uh, Indian thought or methods at that point. But then uh, in the next year or two, I got married and I got a job teaching at Indiana University uh, at a branch campus of Indiana University. And I moved with my wife to uh, Chicago. And there we got involved in a, with a spiritual group, and I got I uh, took some LSD, and that was an eye opener too. But the real turning point, although I was I was very interested in spiritual evolution and consciousness and exploring all that, the real turning point came when I was invited to a private dinner party uh, for Ramdas, who I knew as Richard Alpert you know, who was a psychologist with Timothy Leary, had been experimenting with LSD at Harvard. Uh, so I got invited to this very small, maybe eight people dinner party, and they sat me next to him. And he was all in white with a long beard. You know, I didn't know anything about him other than he had been, he was well known for being Leary's sidekick. And then uh, we started talking. And, uh, Whatever happened in that conversation blew my mind and turned me towards India. And from that conversation, I said, I told my wife, I said, 
I want to go to India. I want to find a master. What I learned from him was that great beings, masters, realized beings exist now, not just in ancient times, and that it was possible to study with them. And I was so confused by life. I'd been kind of disenchanted with academia, and I was looking for meaning, and I felt that was there. The question, uh, the, there was one question I asked, which in recounting it, it sounds very bland. But I said, I said to him, if a realized being lives in the moment, how can he plan for the future? How can he even cross the street? And Ramdas said, a realized being plans for the future in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but it blew my mind. And I thought, <laughs> this guy knows something. <laughs> then in the, in the succeeding months, we went to all his lectures and so on. And uh, after the end of the year, we uh, went to Europe. I bought a Volkswagen van in Amsterdam. The two of us drove all the way across Europe and Asia to India. You could do it in those days. Wow. And that was an adventure. Uh, yeah. And so then it gets interesting because <laughs> I had no names and addresses. I had, well, I had the name Bhagwan Das, who had been one of Ram Das's connection points, you know. And I had another name, which was his yoga teacher, whose actual name is Hari Das, but I had the name incorrectly as Hatsi Das. Mm -hmm. That's all. I didn't have a location, anything, but I was so filled with some deep inner urge uh, that this is the right direction. And, you know, that was very uh, much of an anomaly in my life <clears throat> because I used to plan things very down to the, you know, down to the minute. Mm -hmm. And here I was going off, off half cocked India with no names and addresses on some strange uh mission but something had happened inside me so there was a, a knowing or a certainty uh yeah. so we got to delhi and i saw a, kind of a western hippie kid in the street and i said hey man where are the yogis and he said up in rishikesh man so i told my wife let's go to rishikesh she's, she's a little more reluctant she wanted to see the Taj Mahal and things like that. But anyway, the next day, we went for lunch at a little place on Kanaut Circus, which is the central uh, center there of the, of the city. <clears throat> and it was uh, called the Kosi Nook, and it catered to Westerners. So we went in there, and I saw a guy who had long hair and was wearing white, and he looked like one of Ram Dass's uh acolytes so i went up to him and said you know ramdas he said very well so i said you know bhagwan das he said he's right upstairs and it turned out that this fellow and a group of four or five uh devotees of nimkaroli baba ramdas's guru were sitting up there waiting to get means of of transportation to go visit Nimkaroli Baba up in the mountains. And here we were with a big empty van wanting a direction. Mm -hmm. And so the next day, off we were. We were going up into the Himalayas with uh, Bhagwan Das driving and chanting. And Krishna Das was one of them. He was chanting. So my first chanting that I heard was Krishna Das and Bhagwan Das in my front seat. <laughs> chanting uh, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram. And off we were on the adventures, like uh, it happened like some kind of strange destiny. Sounds like a movie. <laughs> it's, it's like a movie. <laughs> and then uh, then we got to uh, up to um, Hardwar, and we did a little bit of yoga with Haridas. I met Haridas. Haridas had been a disciple of Nimkaroli Baba and was uh, Ram Dass's yoga teacher. So we did some and I felt really good. We're on the Ganges, we're doing uh, stretches. I thought, 
my quest is really going. And then we went further up the, into the Himalayas to Nanital, which is a hill station the British used to go in summers. Uh, and we were waiting for um, Nimkarli Baba, uh, who's Ramdas's guru, to show up. He, he, he was slated to come there very soon. And he was in a town very close to there. So we, we stayed there for a couple of weeks waiting. And he didn't show up. So we made a decision that we're going to go down and study with Haridas Baba. He could teach us the techniques of yoga. So we loaded the van. And as we were about to drive away, somebody came running. Nimkroli Baba is here. So we unloaded the van. Everybody jumped in. We drove over and we had Nimkroli Baba's darshan. And that was quite extraordinary. And we had some dialogue with him and spent some time with him. It was, uh, you know, a wonderful being. But I, I couldn't figure out what what use I could make of him. Like, because he didn't have a teaching. You just sat around him and you chanted a little bit. Mm. And he would uh, just go ram, 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 ram. And uh, uh, then serve you tea. And that was it. And I didn't know then that just to be with a being of that level and sitting in their presence, there's a transmission that mm -hmm. happened. But I was I was into Western technology, so I thought I've got to learn the technology of yoga. Mm -hmm. So after a while, I, I said, I want to go down to Haridas. And I got his permission. And we sat down and then we spent the, the winter doing Hatha yoga was Haridas Baba down in uh, in uh, Hardwar, Hardwar Rishikesh area. And we did postures, and we did a lot of pranayama, and we did cleansing exercises, which involved um, uh, pu putting a, a string up one note, nostril and pulling it out the other. Wow. And the, the most extreme one was what they called doti, where you take you boil a bandage like cloth, which is like 25 feet long. And then you slowly eat it, with, you know, drink water <laughs> until you get it down with a little bit left out. And then you pull it up oh. and you hold it up and it's all green. And then after a few days, it's clear and you're getting rid of mucus and all this. It's called doti. It's a purification. Actually had a very good effect on me, mm. on digestion and helped my asthma. So on, I probably could use it now. But <laughs> <laughs> so we did all that, and then he left to the states. He was invited to the states, and then we hooked up with Ramdas again, who was meditating in Bodh Gaya, and he invited us to come on a bus with him to meet the saint that he had just traveled with, named Swami Muktananda. He said he's a great master of kundalini awakening and do you want to go and we said yeah <laughs> so we went uh, to delhi with him and it was there that i met baba muktananda so that's uh, that much of the story there so ramdas actually introduced you to muktananda he introduced me to he introduced me to the path of yoga and he introduced oh. me to india and he introduced me to my guru baba muktananda yes that's powerful. Not only that, not only that, that when we were there in Delhi together, he bought my van. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, and of course, we didn't have use for it anymore. We were going down to uh, Bombay to Muktananda's ashram. And uh, I thought, I always thought of my van as similar to his Land Rover. He went to India in a Land Rover, and he told colorful stories about it. So I thought my van is like Ramdas's Land Rover. Now I was selling my van to Ramdas. Mm -hmm. So we went to the we went to the customs office, and we're in the office signing the papers. And there's a window, and down down on the courtyard there are a bunch of old vehicles which have been impounded. And he look, tells me he says, "Look," he says, "That's my Land Rover down there." <laughs> I thought, "Wow." You're always in a Ramdas story when you're with Ramdas. 
<laughs> yeah, that's one thing that stuck out to me when we talked before we were recording was how you said when you were in Ramdas's presence, you felt like uh, you were in his story, like you were in a chapter of his story. And well, that's that funny. happened even more. I, I mentioned that we went on the bus. Uh, we were in Bodh Gaya meditating with him. And we took the bus to Delhi where we met Muktananda. And we got to Allahabad. And we were at the site where the Kumbh Mela is. And somebody yells out, there's Nimkarli Baba. And Ramdas hadn't seen his guru for a long time. And so there was Nimkarli Baba walking up the road. So we all jumped out and uh, pranamed his feet. And he greeted us. He goes, Ramdas, you know. And he apparently had a, a feast already. And we were all invited to the feast. We spent a couple of days there. And I thought, this is definitely a chapter in his next book. And it was. <laughs> he's written about that. Yeah, that's the famous bus story. Yeah, and then, the, then he also tells the stories about my bus later on. Mm -hmm. The VW, you're saying? The VW, yeah. It's yeah. in, it's in uh, one of his books. Yeah. <laughs> that's so wild. Yeah, I feel personally, you have to learn about his story with Neem Karoli Baba and all of the many stories that are within his relationship with him to be able to get it. And I don't know what it is, but it's kind of like a, a transmission in a way. It's an awakening. Yeah. An awakening. Uh, you know, I've never felt that Ramdas was my guru. But I felt that he was the messenger of someone who was my guru somewhere. Yeah. You know, and but Ramdas was carrying a power, a shakti, we would say, uh, a, a wisdom power, uh, enormous then. You know, he turned on thousands of Westerners. You know, he had so much. His stories were so enchanting. I never mm -hmm. heard. I was completely riveted. I, you mm -hmm. know, I could listen to him forever, I thought. It was, so he was really carrying something. He was... He was a messenger at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so he talked about the awakening, that there was a possibility to awaken from uh, this mundane life to a higher consciousness. And he embodied that, and that's what it was. And my guru, Baba, used to talk about Shaktipat awakening, which he would say is the awakening of Kundalini, or you could say the awakening of consciousness. Uh, and um, all, the, all the paths talk about some kind of awakening. And in, you know, some call it enlightenment, but it's not a full enlightenment. It's the beginning of enlightenment, you could say. Uh. Where our consciousness has changed from mundane, ego-based, ego-centered, to connected to a higher power or to the deeper self, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Ramdas was showing. My guru used to say, meditate on the self, honor the self. God dwells within you as you. So the, the form of God you know is you, if you found your true self, the deepest self. Yeah, so, that's the essence of it. Yeah, and so uh, Ramdas was carrying an extraordinary shakti in those days. Mm. Yeah. Do you feel as though in order to have this realization, one needs to be able to get it from somebody? Like it is a almost like a chain link initiation or transmission that comes from a person that is already realized and you have to get like a spark from them to ignite it within yourself? I think that's the way it mostly happens. That mm -hmm. uh, mostly happens through a connection with someone who is already there or been there and creates this connectedness. Now, I can't say that it cannot have happened in other ways because there are examples of spontaneous awakenings happening without a, a guru figure there, like Ram Raman Maharshi. Mm. He just suddenly awakened when he was a kid. But I think for most people, to be in contact with a realized being is, uh, is uh, well, it's certainly a great thing. And certainly in my case, that's the way it happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why would you, if that's a, a, a way, and if there are people of that stature, why would you reject it, you know, <laughs> worth, worth using it? 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's a no brainer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So let me ask you this one. You were around a lot of wise beings, including Neem Karoli Baba, Ram Dass. Yep. Those are, you know, those are the top the top G's. <laughs> Ananda Lai Ma, I met. I also met the Sargadatta Maharaj. Yeah, so, okay, so that's and even... Goenka, Goenka too, I started with. Okay, so this is going more <laughs> so into my question. That's amazing. But what was it about Swami Muktananda that made you say, yeah, this, this guy is something special. He's the one that I have to follow. Uh, it's, it's like falling in love. You just don't, you can't uh. say. It's just, uh, I just saw that he was there. Mm-hmm. And I felt a lot of love and admiration for him. And the, the connection just was there. I can't explain it. I don't claim that he was greater than the other ones uh, that I mentioned. But to me, he was. But, you know, but I don't claim that. Uh, I don't, it's, it's destiny, I think. Just like yeah. you meet your wife or your husband. Uh, you know, how do you explain something like that? Mm. I think I was... I see. I could have been if I'd understood it. I it could have been with Nimkarli Baba, or Ananda Maima, who I met also before I met Baba. Uh, but that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, one of those mysteries. Life is filled with these strange mysteries. Yeah. Uh, but with Baba, it was a, a real connection. Everything about him uh, seemed right to me, and. Mm -hmm. struck me and yeah. besides my inner experience started to soar and my meditations were profound in his presence did you just know when you were in his presence there's just something about it like can you take us back to like the first time that you met <laughs> your guru yeah well the uh, first time it was like i was i was very impressed and uh uh but i can't say that the awakening uh, I, and then when I, then when we went down to uh, Bombay and then eventually ended up at his ashram when I got to his ashram he wasn't there but the ashram really impressed me because it was so on purpose and there was so much energy there and it seemed like this is because Gurdjieff used to talk about mystery schools which is I would call schools of second education not like university, which is first education, but another kind of education uh, where sadhana or spiritual practice is taught. And I thought, this is a mystery school. Everybody here is going through it and really trying to find the self. I was very impressed by it. When I saw his school, that was a really important step. And then when he came back a few months later on, on, uh, on a particular holiday, Guru Purnima, I gave him a little gift, and he looked in my eyes, and there was a distinct transmission mm. of energy. And I walked away sort of reeling from it. And then different things started happening in me. And my first impulse was, I must be getting malaria. <laughs> and I thought, idiot, you're in Kundalini Central. It's an awakening. And so that was that. That was one awakening. And then later on, uh, he gave me a teaching. I asked him a question, and he said to me, always remember, I am the self. Always say to yourself, I am the self. I am not a beggar. I am not a king. I am the self. And he said that. And as he said it, there was some kind of transmission happened, and I went into bliss, and I felt kind of Shiva consciousness, you could say that that was my true identity. And I was uh, in kind of ecstasy for days after that. Mm. And he came up to me. I was watering plants in the garden. He said, do you like that answer? He says, I think, yeah. <laughs> But that was a second awakening. Many things that happened with him, but those are two early significant ones. Wow. Wow. That's, yeah. um, that's pretty impressive. The amount of wise realized beings that you have come across in your life i'm lucky i feel really i don't i can't account for it just uh, blind luck i guess <laughs> blind luck yeah. but all you need is one 
Yeah. <laughs> really? It's all yeah. You need. I mean, it's a blessing to be even in the presence of one. To be honest with you. Yeah. 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 Um, would you say that is the greatest thing that we can do to have this realization ourselves? Is just to surround ourselves with people that realize this, and then pretty much take all you can get from them. <laughs> Yeah, well, there are different levels of it because um, uh, if you think about it, anyone who's on any kind of spiritual path, there's usually a great being at the source of it. Like Christianity, there's Jesus. Yep. And uh, Buddhism, there's the Buddha. And, you know, the Hindus acknowledge the Buddha as a great yogi, a great meditator. And he taught a powerful path. Jesus, a great yogi of love. And he showed the path of love. And so to read about them thousands of years later, you still get something. Yeah. And then to read about somebody closer at hand, like Sri Ramakrishna or Raman Maharshi or Nasagadatta, you still get something from them. So even more so to actually sit in the presence of one, mm. to just be with one, there's an actual energetic uh, transmission that happens. Mm-hmm. Shakti Baba would call it. And so that that's the easiest path. You can do all kinds of practices. Spend 20 years in the Himalayas uh, uh, chewing rocks or something. I've seen everything in India. Guys who penetrated their, their uh, cheeks with arrows, you know, and uh, all kinds of strange yogis. But the simplest thing is to sit in the presence and let this process of osmosis take place and the energy just fills you yeah then you learn how to hold on to it yeah hmm and do you feel as though once you have this energy you sort of have to give it out as an offering right not in an evangelical way but you just have to like spread the love a little bit you have to you have to share it yeah it becomes a responsibility to tell everyone, hey, this is what's really essential in life, is to know the self. And I would I would describe the path as this, what the great beings tell us. You know, we usually think in terms of incrementally attaining something, like a degree or something. But they tell us that the self is perfect within every one of us, within you, within me. And I, I call it, you know, I don't want to call it Atman or something esoteric or Brahman, but the clear space of good feeling. Because everyone's felt that. Sometime or other, you've been in a place where you feel fine, you feel balanced, your feelings are harmonious, loving, uh, your mind is clear. That's the clear space of good feeling. And so the, in, in real spirituality, it, become, it centers around that clear space of good feeling. It's if you're in it, learn how to stay in it. If you lose it, learn how to get back to it. Simple as that. Mm. Hold the clear space of good feeling. Now, why do you lose it? You lose it because your mind starts up chattering, hating yourself. You get what I call tearing thoughts where you tear into yourself. And then emotionally, you go into jealousy, you go into anger, you go into paranoia and fear. And all these things take you away from the clear space of good feeling. And emotions like love, harmony, joy, put you in the clear space of good feeling. And so you, you learn the practice of staying in it and going back to it when you lose it. And that's simple for everybody. Everyone can understand that. But there's an actual methodology for, for uh, doing that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in... In the West, we have very, shall we say, stupid ideas about it. We think everybody wants to be in the clear space of good feeling, but they think if I got a big car, that would help me. Yep. If I got Miss Right or Mr. Right, that would help me. If I won that award, got that degree, made that money. Now, all those things help temporarily, but they don't solve the essential issue, which is the space itself, how to stay in it regardless of what happens. Mm -hmm. So that's, to me, the essence of spirituality. And that's what I learned from my guru. 
really. Well said. Very well said. <laughs> Put you in my own understanding. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. But it's all, it's, it's there in everyone. Mm. But you also have to do a little work for it. Mm -hmm. You have to focus on it. Yeah. Would you say the work or practice revolves around meditation and self inquiry? Yeah, absolutely. Meditation is the bedrock uh, where you go direct to the self. And self inquiry is to see, to really get rid of the things that arise that take you away from the clear space of revealing. So if I were to give, give one sentence, I'd say the yoga that I teach is based on the clear space of good feeling. And the great aid to it is the guru. The great aid to it is meditation. And the great aid is self-inquiry also. Mm -hmm. But it's anyone who is interested can attain it, I believe, it, because that's our true nature. Yeah. But at, at this level of evolution, most people are more interested in externals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and there's nothing much you can do about it. No. Now, what do you think? Except what you're doing, what you're doing is helping, uh, you know, enlightenment spread by talking about these matters. And I hope so. <laughs> we're all, we're all laborers in that, in that field of trying to spread the, spread the teaching. We're all lingerers, you said? What? Laborers. We're all... Oh, laborers. Yes. Oh, yeah, we're, all we're, laborers. we're digging in that garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, uh, critical mass will come and uh, the world will be much better. But I think I if you so. look at the current political situation, you have to say that it's uh, pretty benighted at this moment. Although there yeah. are signs of light. I think so too. Yeah. It's got to. Yeah. You got to. Um... Turn off the news. You know, the news won't show you the signs of light. <laughs> the news won't show you, no. It's like a, um, uh, the revolution won't be televised type of thing. <laughs> who said that? I remember that. I don't know actually who said it. I know it's a famous quote or a song or something, but yeah. I think yeah that's, that's the right. essence of it. Um, Must have been the Jefferson Airplane. <laughs> you know, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, man, what was I going to ask? I was going to ask something. Oh, yeah. Do you think the the chaos, the commotion, the, the darkness of the world is what ultimately brings us to this clear space of, what did you say, well, clear space of well- Good feeling. Good, good feeling. feeling. Okay. Yeah, do you well, think you know, that- Go ahead. Yeah, inside, inside, I'm just explaining it. Because mm -hmm. inside you, if you look inside- there are two basic things inside you, thoughts and feelings. So when the, the mind is clear and the feelings are, are good, that's, that's the space you want to be in. If you could be in that all through your life, everything would go well for you. Mm -hmm. You get the job, you're hunting, you, uh, you, know, you get the right person, everything. So, yeah, what were you asking about? Oh, the chaos. Yeah, I think, yeah, look, yeah, I think it wakes us up when it's really horrible. But um, that's a terrible methodology to go to the dark side to get to the light. Uh, you know, the, the Hindus have um, a good thing. They talk about the four ages of, of man, you know. And at first there's the golden age when everyone is very moral and uh, high-minded and close to God. And then the next stage, it's a quarter less that way. And the next stage is another quarter less. And then the age we're in is called the Kali Yuga, in which everyone's ignorant and lost in kind of darkness. But then that ends and we go back to uh, a higher awareness. Mm. So... Let's see what happens in the election. We'll see if we're getting out of the Kali Yuga. <laughs> <laughs> Let us see. It might take a little longer than that, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, you know, Maharishi, uh, Mahesh Yogi used to say, when a certain number of people meditate, there'll be a shift in consciousness. And I have to say, I'm, I agree with him, that the more people that meditate and think about these things, 
the closer we are to having a different kind of culture. But we're not, but don't be, uh, you can't fool yourself. We're not there yet. Mm -mm. No. No. Well, would you say what matters is that you find this kingdom of heaven within, as Jesus would say? It's like, don't worry about the kingdom of heaven without more so just find that uh, within and then that naturally will bring about a better space within your life and then also just naturally the world follows soup. Well, you sound just like Muktananda now. That's exactly <laughs> what he would say. He'd say, turn within, yeah. 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 I feel that. Remember he had a dialogue with a, a Christian priest one time. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the priest was being very dogmatic. He says, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. And Baba finally said, oh, but where is he now? He's gone. And uh, the priest said, he's here. And Baba said, yes, that's what I'm saying. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, if I ever come across a fundamental Christian, <laughs> I'm going to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where is he? <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, do you think every saint and sage is essentially saying that it's within, you know? This, uh, uh, yes, I do. I think the, the, the true ones are, yeah. are basically saying, if you look at what they're saying, that it all has to do with our own consciousness. When we purify our consciousness, it's the same as the divine. It's divine consciousness. God doesn't have a form. God is formless. And what he is is pure consciousness. And we, you know, to be conscious is such a miracle. Be conscious. If you look at the stone over here, stone has no consciousness. But you have consciousness. Your microphone doesn't have consciousness. But you have consciousness. What a remarkable thing to be a conscious being. Yes. And uh, if you purify that consciousness, there's no limit to what you can attain. Yeah. Now, what does the purification process look like? Does that, do you mean, um, like reorientation in our habits and rituals in life, uh, living a simpler life? What would you say that means to purify? It begins with, it begins with meditation and mm -hmm. trying to get in touch with the true self. Because the true self exists within everyone, the clear space of good feeling. And then it means trying to live life uh, openly and consciously uh, and not to give vent to negative emotions like anger and fear and not try, not just e express them, but try not to go that way, go towards joy and love yeah. and meditate, meditate and Knowledge will come, and then you'll know what to do. Sometimes you have to give something up, but sometimes it's okay to to uh, have something, enjoy something. It's all right. Mm -hmm. There's no formula, but the, the, with the, it's the aspiration, I think. Uh, what in the Sagadara used to call it earnestness, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, Shankaracharya, you know, the head, the beginning, the founder of Vedanta, used to call it mumakshutta, the desire for liberation. If you really want to know yourself, if you really want to find inner peace, it'll happen. It's the aspiration that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what method you use if the aspirations are. You mm -hmm. can stand on your head or jump up and down and you'll still get there. Yeah. Yeah. And that will just guide the way. Like there is this intuitive knowing or intelligence that will lead one toward that path. And throughout all dilemmas of our life, if you just stay on that wavelength of pretty much who am I, who am I? That's right. That's right. There's a complete knower inside. We usually, we usually know in retrospect, like oh, I should never have married that person. You know, 30 years later, right, after the divorce settlement. Uh, or I should never have done that thing. There's a knower. And, of course, there was a voice at the time that said that to you, but you didn't listen to it. 
Uh, yeah. But there is a true voice. There is a true voice, but we haven't learned to hear it. And there are other voices that we're listening to, the voice of fear, the voice of desire, the voice of jealousy. We listen to all those voices. So you have to learn how to find the true voice. And then we'll be okay. Learn how to listen. Yeah, yeah. 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 That was another reason that my years with uh, Baba Muktananda were valuable because he became a, a homing device kind of. Oh, I see. But his vibration straightened me out all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would often happen that I would get all frazzled during the day, and then we'd have satsang at night. He'd give a talk, and just in his presence, I, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's it, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because he's like a tuning fork. Yeah. That tunes you back to you, right? Tunes you back, yeah. Mm -hmm. You seem to have that relationship with Ramdas a bit. Yep. Yep, yeah, I do. And the magical thing is, and weird thing is, I never met him. That's I understand. the power of the guru. Yeah. Well, it's not about him personally. It's about what yeah. he was carrying. Mm -hmm. And he was a very important emissary of that light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't think you get it until you understand the story, right? It's kind of like, you're not going to understand Jesus unless you read the Bible. You kind of have to understand the story of Jesus in order to understand Jesus. Well, I think it's similar to the story of Ram Dass. And um, yeah. it's very yeah. peculiar to his story because the thing about him, too, is he's very informal. Like, he doesn't, his lineage isn't really a lineage, right? Like, it's not like any, there's no name yeah. for it. And it's so um, recent as well, too. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah. He, just, he just left his body in 2020. So there's something special about him for the West and to me at least that I feel, but you have to understand his story first in, in order to, to get it. Well, you know, I understood the story so much that I imitated it right down to taking a trip to Asia <laughs> and then I sold him my car. That was, <laughs> yeah, you were that the was story. My, my worship of him. <laughs> yeah, you were the story. <laughs> yeah. This is the story. That's the thing. Yeah. The story is still being written. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, that's right. And it's not Ramdas's story, right? It's not um, Richard that's Alpert's story. Of, it's all of our story. That's right. He was just a strong storyteller, you could say, or a strong character in it. But yeah. really, we're all partaking in the living story. As but there speak. is a narrative, you know. The narrative is that uh, that Shaivism says is Shiva. Uh, is full of his own bliss and his own wisdom and his own light. And then out of, gets the idea to create the universe. Mm -hmm. And in creating the universe, in that moment, he forgets who he is and it becomes all of us. <clears throat> now, we are sheep, but we don't know it now. So we try this, we try that, we go bunk our head against uh, this door and that door and, and get confused. And we have born and reborn and reborn and reborn many lifetimes each picking up some knowledge, some experience. And eventually we come to a time when we start to walk the path. And then we go back and we discover, oh, I am Shiva. Mm -hmm. And it's the end of the story. So the whole story comes back home. <laughs> yeah. The story is one of, oh, how do I put this? <laughs> the story of, Forgetting that you're in a story, then realizing you're in the story of forgetting yourself. <laughs> and then remembering. Yeah, it's a story of remembering, essentially, what you are. It's like a remembering the joke that you played on yourself. <laughs> See, what you just said now, right? Let's say you've had many births. I don't know if you accept that. You accept that idea? That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Okay. So let's say you've had many births, and, and if you go back a few births, what you just said would make no sense at all to you. <laughs> yeah. But through the process of being born and reborn and learning, you've come to understand that narrative. So you, you've become conscious that that narrative, which is the, the true narrative, I think, yeah. mm -hmm. the fundamental narrative of forgetting who we are and then coming back to who we are. That narrative has come to you. So that means you're at close to the end of the process. It's a very good sign. Mm. 
And it would be good if more people understood life that way. We're getting there. <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah, that's the goal. Mm hmm. And that's a good point. I feel as though this makes a lot more sense. The Dharma altogether makes a lot more sense when you put it into the context of multiple lives. If you just think this is it, this is one life, this, this is it. It doesn't, uh, Eastern philosophy just doesn't add up. It doesn't compute. Well, and then you burn in hell. You burn <laughs> yeah. in hell. I mean, life is so hard to figure out. Yeah. If you're only given one shot at it, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. complicated. You need many shots and many ch chances to try to work it out. God yeah. would be very cruel if he says, I'm going to give you one chance, and if you fail it, you go to hell forever. Yeah. What kind of monster is that? Even, even my worst enemy wouldn't be that mean. That's yeah. really cool. So I think it's much, the universe more compassionate, in which every soul, not one will be lost, Every soul will come to the light, going through whatever they have to go through over many lifetimes. Mm. Yeah, that's another miracle right there. Every soul will be every soul, found. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, every soul is a part of God. Yeah, no matter how evil or ignorant they may be, it's God and drag. Even that, even mm. that. Mm hmm Yeah. That's the Not essence of the any path. Names. What'd you say? Not mentioning any names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of names we could mention, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, they're all just God and drag. No matter how dense somebody may appear, it's just an appearance. Truly. Yeah. Um, do you think that's where this all leads to? Once one does see and feel Shiva within oneself, it's being able to see Shiva in another's eyes. And with that understanding, um, your relationship changes to them. Like you inevitably have to love them because it's just Shiva looking at Shiva, you know? Yeah, well, that's uh, the Vigana Bharva, great tantric text, says you see consciousness behind the eyes of everyone. And my guru used to say, see God in each other. He said that was his worship, not to go to worship a, a stone image, but to worship another person as God, because God dwells within everyone. Mm -hmm. I think if we could live that principle, wow, the world would be different, wouldn't it? It'd be an alien world. They're pointing fingers and blaming everyone. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sounds like the 60s, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is like the 60s 2.0. I don't know. I mean, yeah. you lived through it, so you know. But from what I yeah. understand of the 60s, it seemed like a, a revolution in itself, a revolution of consciousness. There was a cultural awakening, a, you know, not full, but a partial awakening that happened then. And mm -hmm. these great gurus came to the West beginning around 1970. That's when they started coming. So the awareness started, uh, it, it changed at that point. Of course, the human evolution goes through stages. So even though we're still in darkness to a high degree, there are more, there are more points of light, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. Do you think we're coming out of Kali Yuga at this point? Or do we still have a little ways to go? Mm, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think I think that the, the signs are good. Yeah. I think signs are good. But rather than speculate about that, everyone should should come out of Kali Yuga in their own heart. Yep. You know, the darkness inside. That's the that's the way. That you can control. Epictetus mm -hmm. said you shouldn't worry about things outside the control. You should work on what you can control. And everyone can control their own inner state, their own inner space. Can't control the culture. You can't. You can't determine the way Pennsylvania and Michigan are going to vote. But you can control yourself. You can learn. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, that might be a good note to wrap this up at. Well, it's been very enjoyable, Gary. Yeah, for sure. And uh, 
I can see you're a, you're a good meditator and you're doing good work in the in the field of spirituality. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Talking that. about these topics. Yeah, I just um, this is what I like to do. This is my sadhana. I feel is to be yeah. able to come on here with people like you and extract as much wisdom and knowledge as I can. You know, like the fact that we can do this is another miracle, right? You're across the world, <laughs> and we're across speaking to world. each other. Melbourne, uh, Australia. <laughs> yeah. So the it, the fact that we have this technology and I'm able to reach out to people like you, it's to me. I can't help but do it. You know, I can't help but talk about this stuff. What else is there to do with this technology? I mean, there's a lot more to do, but I'm saying what higher pursuit I feel could I do with this technology? So, yeah, I'm just doing it because I like to do it. And I really appreciate you coming on here. It's an honor for me to do it with people like you. And uh, yeah, that's it. I greatly appreciate you coming on here, Swami. Thank you. It's a great enjoyment. And, you know, a lot of people are misusing this technology. Mm -hmm. it, this technology is very new, and we haven't learned what we're supposed to do with it. But I think you're in the vanguard. You're doing it for good. That's a great thing. So I've enjoyed it, Gary. Be well. You as and well. Take care. Thank you. And hope I uh, meet you again. I think we will. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Thank you very much, Swami. And uh, thank anybody that listened this long, too. I appreciate you all. Okay. Peace and love okay. to you. And peace and love to the listener. Goodbye, everybody.